Welcome. In this video, I will address common grammatical challenges that I have observed in student writing. Now, I am not a grammar pedant. I don't think grammar is the be-all and end-all of writing or speech. But because grammar sets the rules, the expectations of a language, it's useful to know what those rules are so that you can choose to apply them as expected or, in the case of some literature, to bend the rules or even break the rules. But you have to know what the rules are to begin with. I've collected some examples of errors that I've observed in papers that students have written in my courses, and I'd like to show you how not to repeat these errors that the students made. Let's get started. The advice that I offer in this video does not address all the nuances of American English grammar. It just identifies some of the misuses of English that I've observed in student work. And so, rather than point out examples of the errors that my students have made, I'm going to take what I've learned from their errors and try to present direct instruction regarding how the grammatical structures should be used. The most common grammatical errors that I've observed in student writing have been related to voice, mood, punctuation, and choice of vocabulary. Voice comes in two types, active and passive. Mood, it's the subjunctive mood that often gives students difficulty, so I'll compare that to the indicative mood. Colons and semicolons. I think because they are used less frequently than other punctuation marks, sometimes give students trouble. And when it comes to vocabulary, the most common problem with vocabulary that I've observed is the misuse of words that sound similar. Some of these words are even homonyms. And that can change the meaning of the sentence. So it's important to use the correct vocabulary. Let me show you some examples. The active voice is the more commonly used voice in American English. Now, this is not true of all versions of English. For example, uh, passive voice is more commonly used in British English than it is in American English. Now, I can't say that within British English, passive voice is more commonly used than active voice. I just don't know. But at least for American English, active voice is the preferred voice. But passive constructions do have a place. In the active voice, the grammatical subject of the sentence does the action, and this grammatical subject, this noun or pronoun, precedes the verb in the syntax of the sentence. So, the grammatical subject comes before the verb in the word order of the sentence. In the active voice, the grammatical subject receives emphasis because it comes at the beginning of the sentence, or at least because it comes before the verb. In passive voice, the grammatical subject, that noun or pronoun, receives the action of the verb rather than does the action of the verb. Now, while passive voice is common in American speech, it's generally um, 
not preferred in American writing. So, I frequently use the passive voice when I'm speaking, but I try to avoid it when I'm writing my academic papers. Because the passive voice can be judged to be weak or evasive. It, to me, it often sounds a little bit wishy-washy. Like, I don't know who is doing the action. And that's because in passive constructions, the actor, the what I expect to be the subject of the sentence, is not clearly identified or is included later in the sentence or may be omitted from the entire sentence. The actor may not be identified. In passive constructions, the object of the verb receives the emphasis, and usually this object precedes the verb itself. Here are some examples of sentences in the active voice. The team is playing soccer. Now, the subject that's presented in that sentence is team, and the agent is team. The direct object is soccer. That's what the team is playing. So, in active voice, the presented subject and the agent, the actor in the sentence, is the same. Sue ate a piece of cake. Sue is the grammatical subject. Sue is also the agent. And what did she eat? She ate a piece of cake. Tom will fly to Frankfurt on Tuesday. Tom is the subject. Tom is also the person doing the that will do the flying. So, Tom is also the agent. Mom is coming to visit. Mom is the subject of the sentence, and mom is also the person who will come to visit. And you can read the other examples. And I want you to notice that the agent in active voice constructions is presented as the subject of the sentence. Keep that in mind as I show you some examples of passive constructions. Here in passive voice constructions, the presented subject and the agent, the noun that does the action, are mixed up. Soccer is played by the team. Now, I would assume most Americans could understand what that sentence conveys. But soccer is presented as the subject of the sentence, even though the noun that does the action is team. Soccer is really the direct object of the verb played. But by placing soccer at the beginning of the sentence and creating a passive voice construction, soccer is emphasized. So, it's soccer is played by the team. Not basketball, not baseball, not cricket. A piece of cake was eaten by Sue. Now, a piece of cake is given emphasis. It's the presented subject in the sentence. Sue is the agent, though. She's the one doing the eating. And piece of cake is grammatically, it's the direct object. It's what Sue ate. But by placing the object at the beginning of the sentence and presenting it as the subject of the sentence in a passive construction, the object, a piece of cake, is given emphasis. Now, 
I want to caution you. I've tried to create examples of both active and passive voice constructions in multiple tenses. Tense has to do with time. Is it present tense, taking place now, past tense, or future tense? Past tense meaning it has already occurred, future tense meaning it will occur. Other than voice, mood is maybe the next most common challenge with grammar that I've observed in student writing. Indicative and subjunctive mood often get misused. Indicative mood gets used correctly. It's the subjunctive mood that often gets ignored by students. Indicative mood is used with statements or questions related to fact. Subjunctive mood is used to express a wish, a desire, a hypothetical situation, or to give a command. And subjunctive mood requires the use of what we, you and I might think of as non-standard conjugations of verbs. For example, I demanded that she be promoted. Normally we would say she is promoted. But here in the subjunctive mood, we'd use the base form of that verb to be. And I chose the word base verb rather than infinitive verb because technically the infinitive form of a verb begins with the preposition to. To be is the uh, infinitive form. Be is the base form. The other way to think of it is the base form of a verb is the head word if you were to look up that word in a dictionary. It's how the dictionary would alphabetize the word. B for B. <laughs> that was kind of funny. The letter B for the word B, B E. <laughs> Another example of subjunctive mood in the present tense I want to be left alone. Now, subjunctive mood generally becomes necessary when describing past tense um, constructions, such as, if you remember back to the early 1960s, the marketing song for Oscar Mayer uh, hot dogs was, if I were an Oscar Mayer wiener, rather than if I am an Oscar Mayer wiener. So, in this case, because I'm not an Oscar Mayer, I'm not a hot dog, I'm using the subjunctive mood and therefore using the what we normally think of as the plural form of the verb to be, were, W-E-R-E, -E, the plural form. If I were an Oscar Mayer wiener, then everyone would be in love with me. If he were with us, we would be in good shape. Now, I'll bet if you said to yourself, if he was with us, we would be in good shape. And you might say to yourself, that sounds okay. He was. Singular pronoun, singular verb. But because it's a subjunctive mood construction, instead of using the singular form of the verb, the plural form is used. If he were with us, we would be in good shape. Here are some more examples. Indicative mood, these are statements related to fact. I like candy. You are not required to attend the meeting. 
We went to the movies in the past. I did not like the film in the past. Or in the future, they will soon arrive. She will not participate in class today. These are related to fact. They're not suppositions. They're not hypotheses. They are not desires. They're not wishes. But with subjunctive mood, I wish to be invited. He must take you to class. That's a command. So, normally it would be he takes, as in he takes his books to school with him. But in a command, the subjunctive mood is used. He must take you to class. Hmm. I don't know what happened to his books because he's taking you to class rather than his books. If I miss the ball, I will be the last out of the inning. Normally it's I am. If I miss the ball, I am the last out of the inning. That's indicative, but because it's a statement of possibility, it's a statement, a, a hypothetical situation, the subjunctive mood is needed. If I miss the ball, I will be the last out of the inning. Now, subjunctive mood can also be used in the past tense. If she were to have joined us, not if she was to have joined us. So I'm using, in this case, I'm using the plural form of the verb to be in the past tense. If she were to have joined us. Had I been in attendance, not had I am in attendance. That, that, to me, doesn't even sound right. I've always heard people say, had I been in attendance, or if I had been in attendance. Other than mood, colons and semicolons sometimes give students problems. But here's how you can distinguish between the two. Now, a colon is the two dots, one over the other. It indicates that additional information is about to follow. A semicolon, which is a, a dot on top of a comma, joins two independent clauses or separates items in a series in which at least one of the items has an internal comma. This is simpler than it sounds at first blush, but let's make sure we know what an independent clause is. An independent clause could stand as a complete sentence. It has a subject and a predicate, and it it's grammatically complete if it were its own sentence. But when it's used within a more complex sentence, then it's not, it's referred to as an independent clause. Here are simple examples of colons. Use a colon when terminating a formal salutation. You're writing a letter or an email message that requires some degree of gravitas, some a degree of formality. Dear Dr. Smith, colon. Dear Mr. Williams, colon. Use a comma, though, when you're writing in an informal manner. So terminate the salutation of an informal email or letter using a comma. Dear John, comma. And a colon can be used to introduce a list of examples. For example, they have three engineering specialties, colon, mechanical, civil, and electrical. Now, 
That list doesn't have to have multiple items in it, but it usually does. Otherwise, there's really no need for the colon. For some reason, and I think it's because it's used very infrequently, semicolon tends to give most students a headache. It's just, it seems to be a problem punctuation mark, but it's actually a very straightforward mark. I like candy, semicolon. I do not like vegetables. Two independent clauses combined together into a single sentence require separation using a semicolon or a comma and a conjunction, such as, I like candy, comma, but I do not like vegetables. Another example of the semicolon, our firm is well established, semicolon. It has been in operation for three generations. Now, both clauses are independent. Our firm is well established. That could be its own sentence, grammatically. It has been in operation for three generations. That's grammatically complete. That could be its own sentence. But when they're merged together, they can be combined using a semicolon. They could also be combined using a comma with a conjunction, such as, our firm is well established, comma, as it has been in operation for three generations. Now, the use of however is tricky. However can be preceded by a comma but when it's used as an adverbial clause to introduce the um, second independent clause, it requires a semicolon before it. She has no experience attending online classes, semicolon. However, comma, she has three years of in-person uh, class experience. She has no experience attending online classes, is an independent clause. She has three years of in-person class experience, is an independent clause. It's just introduced with the adverb, however. So, when two independent clauses are merged together into a single sentence, they can be conjoined using a semicolon. All right, so here's the other use of a semicolon. I've lived in three cities, Austin, Texas, Wichita, Kansas, and Miami, Florida. And I'm going to correctly spell Wichita. So, I apologize if you're from Kansas. I didn't intentionally mean to misspell that city name. The city and the state, Austin, Texas, Wichita, Kansas, Miami, Florida, are separated grammatically with a comma to indicate city, state. But because they're put in a list, I need some type of punctuation mark to separate each of those three items. So, I can't use a comma because I already used the comma as the state, city state separator. So, instead, I use a semicolon. And those are the two uses of a semicolon joining two independent clauses into a single sentence without the need for a conjunction, and separating items in a list in which at least one of the items in the list has an internal comma. The last grammatical challenge that I've observed for students 
is the misuse of words that sound similar. They don't have to be homonyms, but they do, to the ear, they sound similar. For example, formally, formerly, formally, formerly. When said quickly, they sound very much alike, but they mean very different things. Formally deals with something that's serious or proper or official. Formerly deals with something that happened in the past. Formerly, I was a teacher at XYZ school. Now, fourth and fourth are homonyms. They're said exactly the same way in American English. But fourth, F-O-R-T-H, is something that's to come into view or to be noticed or to move onward in time, as in, the presenter came forth to the lectern. Fourth, F-O-U-R-T-H, is the ordinal of the number four. After having taken three mathematics classes, my fourth course was differential equations. Now, I picked this sentence specifically because I'm going to give you a moment to see if you can notice the grammatical problem in that example sentence. After having taken three mathematics courses, my fourth course was differential equations. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure out what the grammatical problem is. The problem is the sentence indicates that the course, the fourth course, took three other mathematics courses. So I really, to correctly write that sentence, I should have written, after I took three mathematics courses, my fourth course was differential equations. After I took three classes. But here it's a dangling modifier in that the way this sentence is written, grammatically, it means that Diffie Q course, the fourth course, actually took the three other math courses. Write in the comments down below if you are able to identify that grammatical problem. Two words that look alike, but don't even sound alike. Loose, lose. Loose, lose. I'm emphasizing the s and z sounds. Loose, lose. Loose means not tight or constricting. Oh, my socks are so loose today. Lose means to not have possession of something, to have had something and to have lost it, or to be unable to find something, or to keep hold of something. Moral, morale, look alike but don't sound alike. Moral, morale. A moral is a lesson learned, often presented in some form of a story. When used in the plural, as in morals, it's um, related to what is right or wrong. Morale, on the other hand, is an emotional feeling uh, of enthusiasm, as in, the football team had great morale. Now, here's an example of homonyms. Roll, roll. They're pronounced exactly the same in American English. But a roll, R-O-L-E, is a character in a theatrical production or a functional part of a system. Roll, 
R-O-L-L, uh, is related to the idea of top over bottom movement, as in the rock rolled down the hill. But it can also be a really long piece of cloth or other flat object that can then be rolled up for storage or transport. Stationary, stationary. It's, they're homonyms. They are pronounced exactly the same in American English. Stationary with an A relates to not moving. Stationary with an E relates to the materials that are used for writing. Usually, um, it refers to the paper on which writing is done, but it can also refer to the writing implements or the other accoutrements that come with um, writing. What challenges have you had related to grammar in American English? What have you learned from the feedback that your professors have given you uh, when they've guided you to more accurately use grammar in your English writing? What advice did your professors give you? Please share your comments below this video because the errors that you make or the errors that your professors have corrected in your work can help other students by guiding them to not making the same mistakes. Let's teach each other and move academic knowledge forward. I hope that the material I covered in this video will be of use to you, that you don't make the same errors that I've listed here in this presentation. Now, I didn't address all the errors that I've observed in student writing. I just addressed a few of the most common errors. Using grammar correctly can be a shibboleth of your knowledge of the language that you use, that you can demonstrate to others that you know how to use the language well. And while I don't think grammar is necessarily all that important in the big scheme of things, I do think it's valuable to academic success. And in that vein, I wish you the absolute best of success in all of your academic work, particularly your academic writing. And I look forward to seeing you again in a future video. Bye for now. Mika, what a nice dog you are. Come see me. Such a good girl. I love you very much. Did you have a nice day at the park today? Yeah. Did you see squirrels? Yeah, you like the squirrels. You're such a super dog. I love you very much. Okay.